from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, special thanks to the Library of Congress and the National Endowment for the Arts for giving us this opportunity to meet together. Those are my peeps in the back there. Uh, my name is Mohammed Sharif. I'm a literature specialist at the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, where I manage the Translation and Creative Writing uh, Fellowship Program. Um, and I have the distinct honor and pleasure of welcoming today these two phenomenal authors, Peter Ho Davies and Lisa Coe. If you guys are not familiar with who these authors are, uh, Peter Ho Davies, a two-time NEA Creative Writing Fellow, wrote the short story collections Equal Love and The Ugliest House in the World. His novel, uh, The Welsh Girl, set near a prisoner of war camp in North Wales after D-Day, was long listed for the Man Booker Prize. The Fortunes, this lovely thing right here, his most recent novel, and the one we'll be discussing today, follows four Chinese American characters from the 1860s to the present. Peter's joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Lisa Ko is the author of the debut novel, her debut novel, The Leavers, uh, which won the 2016 Penn Bellwether Prize for socially engaged fiction. Or for socially engaged fiction, the novel tells the story of Deming Go, who is abandoned in the Bronx by his undocumented, undocumented Chinese mother and is raised by a white couple upstate. Lisa joins us today from Brooklyn, New York. Thank you guys. All right, we have a few uh, housekeeping rules um, just for the Library of Congress state and for the respect of these authors. Please silent your phones. Um, we're gonna take questions at the end, maybe the last 15 minutes or so, but just remember that this is being recorded, so if you come up to the mic, you have now agreed to be recorded and publicized, I guess. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Lisa, yes. Peter, welcome. Uh, <laughs> thank thank you. you guys for joining us. Um, is this your first time in DC, first book festival, first? It is? Yeah, it's right. my, my first, first national book festival. Yeah. And how's it been so far? It's been pretty rainy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is a pretty terrible day to come, right? Yeah. And I'm yeah. mostly feeling, um, I, I like the, the emphasis on national. We've talked yeah, a lot about right. the mm -hmm. American story over mm -hmm. the last day or so. Um, but as a, as a Brit, I'm feeling slightly uh, uh, as a little yeah. barrel, <laughs> abashed little to be here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so I guess just sort of, so the audience has a sense of where you guys are in your career. Before we get to the book, but you guys can take us to where you are and how you got to these books. Uh -huh. um, you know, Lisa, this is your first novel and you came out the gates just grabbing hearts and dragging it across the page. <laughs> Um, and Peter, this is your fourth book, so maybe you guys can talk a little bit about your process and how you came to and your, your writing career and how you got to these books and the importance of them right now in your career. Little stuff, right? Yeah, the little stuff, right? Yeah. Oh, well, see, what, what, I'm, what I'm admiring Lisa for is writing a first book that is a first novel, because yeah. it took me several efforts to get to that point. I had to write um, a couple of short story collections, and I love that form. But I know that I struggled mightily transitioning from being a short story writer to mm. being a novelist. Mm. I used to joke that um, my first novel, The Welsh Girl, which is this World War II novel, uh, took me seven years to write, which is longer than the Second World War lasted, which oh. is a little embarrassing. <laughs> um, and, and with the, you know, the fortunes, um, and I thought the second novel might be a little easier. Um, but the fortunes also took me seven or eight years. And oh, wow. it, the joke for that one is that it, um, it's a partly about the Chinese building the Transcontinental Railroad. Right. And it took me longer to write the book than it took them to build the railroad. <laughs> um, there were more Chinese on the railroad, it should be said. Um, and if it took me so long to write it, that, that joke is now in the back of the book. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but I, I think for me, that, that movement from one form to the other was mm. uh, a struggle. Uh, I still. I'm really drawn to both forms. Um, and in some ways, I suppose, uh, the four-part structure of the fortunes is a kind of um, a kind of hybrid form somewhere between a novel and a short story collection. Um, and while I'm sure that's somewhat to do with my limitations as a writer or the fact that my center of gravity is still slightly with the short form, uh, I guess I like to retrospectively claim that that hybrid form speaks to the hybrid identities of the characters, which is a nice right. version of that, right? It's a nice idea. Um, it wasn't exactly in my mind as I was writing it, I have to say. Right. Mm. Awesome. Lisa? 
I mean, to be fair, the fortunes does span like 200 years. So you could have spent 10 to 12 <laughs> yeah, years writing. That's true, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. It's quicker than yes. Okay, that's good. Um, yeah, and it's also funny that you mentioned that you thought the second novel would be easier, but it actually wasn't, yeah. which is kind of depressing to hear about now well, as I'm starting to think yeah. about the second novel. Um, and the, the one thing that was good about the, uh, the second novel is that I knew that at points in writing the first novel, I had thought, I will never finish this book. Right. Yeah. And so when I arrived at that point, writing the second novel, I thought, well, you can never know you're never going to finish the right. book. Right. So that like, was, at least that, one was possible. That's right. Like, yeah. You got there once. <laughs> yeah, and I try to keep that in mind, too, as I'm kind of returning to the writing process again. But it, it is really interesting, because it's like, you know, while it, it took me seven years to um, write and publish The Leavers, and I was working on... Short stories at the time, too. Um, unlike Peter, I never actually finished a short story collection, but I often cheated on the novel with short stories mm -hmm. and published them here and there. Um, but yeah, you know, it's also been fascinating to think about how, you know, even after publication mm -hmm. and, and um, the success that comes with publication and marketing the book, at the end of the day, you still have to sit down and, and keep writing, and, and yeah. you're kind of just left yeah. with yourself again. So, yeah. you know, when working in the second book, I'm like, well, here we are again, like back yeah. to kind of starting from scratch, back to facing my own limitations and kind of like dealing with the blank screen or the blank page. Yeah, well, I, I think that sort of is important for us to sort of talk about the structure and the process, um, because you both ended up writing in these four parts and four parts novels. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering how much research went into this period. Your book is so much heavy with research. You know, it almost reads like historical fiction. I mean, it is historical fiction in many parts. And at least the, the, the motivation for your book, and I, I'm sure you had to do a, a, a significant amount of research mm -hmm. as well. Um, so if you guys could talk about that and what went into actually building this. Mm -hmm. In my case, um, you know, a lot of it is, is book research. The first part of the book takes place in the 1860s. Um, the second part is the 1920s and 30s about the Chinese-American movie star Anna Mae Wong. And the third section um, is set in the 1980s during the, um, the period when Vincent Chin was, um, became a hate crime victim in Detroit. Um, and it, oddly, each of those represented slightly different research challenges. Mm. Um, there is a a fair amount of material about the building of the railroad, uh, the transcontinental in the 1860s, but less about the lives of the Chinese who built it. it that's not an accident, of course. Their right. lives are less documented, less well known. Um, so there were lots of gaps to sort of fill imaginatively Ooh. in various ways. Um, with Anna Mae Wong, on the other hand, she was a global celebrity in her day. So uh, there's almost too much material. For a while, I worried that. Um, uh, there was so much factual material out there that I wasn't sure where the fictional space was to mm. invent. Um, and I only really was released from that anxiety when I figured that in a way she's like any global celebrity today. She's like um, you know, Angelina Jolie today. Right? Right. What she might say in a public interview might not actually be the absolute truth. Right. Right? So there's a public image and there's a private life beneath that that the fiction can probe a little bit that is not, yeah. not as accessible to the historical record Ooh. in some ways. Um, and with Vincent's story, it's a lot more recent, a lot of newspaper research. Um, I got to visit some of the sites of the attack because I live near Detroit as well. So it was a mixture of various books, um, newspaper accounts and some site visits as well. And I did actually go, I should say, to, um, to travel the railroad across the Sierra Nevadas where the Chinese did a lot of the work on the railroad. And of course, it's a slightly different route now, and I'm still doing it you know, more than 100 years later, but there's still some sense of the landscape, the color of the sky, oh, the yeah. temperature, yeah. some of the flora and fauna being common. And so while I can't go back in time, there's real pleasure in being able to go to those locations of the, the Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I also, um, like you, Peter, I, I took the um, real, real life stories as sort of mm. the initial starting point um, yeah. of the book, but kind of felt like I needed to sort of push beyond that um, in order to kind of let the story open up. Yeah. So The Leavers was initially inspired by these stories that I was reading in the news about undocumented uh, mothers who'd had their US born children, who were citizens. Um, taken away from them and adopted by American families um, while, while the mothers were being deported or detained. So I was just really kind of horrified and, and interested by these stories and sort of what they, they said about us as Americans mm. and about identity and family and class and race. Um, but I definitely felt intimidated by the subject material at first. You know, I'm not an adoptee, I'm not a parent, um, mm. I'm not from China, so I did a lot of research 
Um, there were several years that I kind of allowed research to, you know, let me procrastinate writing. Um, you know, I traveled to China and found where my characters were from, um, read a lot, spoke to a lot of people, um, and then sort of had to figure out how to separate that from the story and let the characters do their thing um, beyond kind of trying to prove to myself that I did the research. Yeah. Well, that's fascinating because the research question can be about historical material, but it can also be about, uh, I think for both of us, that feeling of uh, cultural research in a certain sense, right. right? That while we have you know, Chinese roots, there's still this feeling of I still need to, I, being of you know, mixed race, I felt like I had to go and learn about that culture and go right. to some of those places as mm -hmm. well. And so that's a, it's almost internal research in a certain sense, Absolutely. just to make yourself right, feel right. that you have the right to write about the material. Right. Yeah, that's a great way to say. It. I think internal yeah. research is a huge yeah. part of writing yeah. that we never really talk right. about, you know, right. which it's it's almost to me feels like it's the bulk of the work sometimes. Right. Um, right. It's very kind of psychological. Yeah. Um, Lizzie, you mentioned something about um, about the characters and feeling them authentic, right? So two characters that you guys sort of created um, in this world where the women are sort of the minorities of minorities. Um, it's poly and anime, right? Mm -hmm. And they sort of stick out in my mind because they're dreamers, they're strivers, they're, they're so much pulling at them, pulling down on them, mm -hmm. yet they persevere, you know? Um, and you guys both created those characters, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I was going to say that the other women are on the periphery, but they're really not. They encounter them all the time. Anime even has prostitutes taking her name, right? To the extent where they're so intermingled. But can you guys sort of talk about your relationship to those characters and why it was mm -hmm. important for them for women and to be represented and to be that sort of juxtaposition between the timid Asian or the prostitute and all those different things mm -hmm. and, and how you both sort of came to have these standing characters. Mm. I mean, Polly was sort of initially inspired by, again, these, these new stories, but it was mostly the framework were the facts surrounding her. Um, I knew that she was an undocumented immigrant from a certain part of China, that she was a mother, and that she and her son had gotten separated and that she was, she was living in New York um, right. and she would get deported. So I was kind of trying to figure out what to write around those facts. Um, what, would, what would a person have to be like and want in order to kind of risk their life um, migrating to another country um, mm. as an undocumented migrant, you know, having to take the risks of paying $50,000 to come to New York? Um, what would it take for this character to have to survive um, working in New York, paying this debt back, raising, raising her child, right? So I think all these things kind of fed into her character um, in terms of making her strong-willed, um, very independent-minded, um, kind of having that adventure spirit. Um, and it sort of became kind of her storyline. Like she's, throughout the book, she's kind of constantly looking for a way to kind of figure out how to live beyond all these expectations that people are putting on her. Um, so she's, as a woman anywhere, she's encountering sexism and, and the patriarchy, and she's kind of figuring right. out how to be a mother, how to be a woman um, on her own terms. Yeah, I think for me, um, you know, I stumbled a little bit onto anime's narrative as I was in the midst of writing the book. The, the first part that drew me to the transcontinental. I was actually quite interested in the, the idea, at least, that uh, an early uh, kind of wave of Chinese immigration into the US was something of a bachelor society. It was a lot of male labor for the railroads to work in, um, in the gold mines. Um, and those men certainly had uh, very difficult and challenging lives, which is what the first part of the book addresses to some degree. But in the research, it became very clear that the lives of the smaller number of Chinese women, I think there were maybe one, there's one Chinese woman for every 20 men who came mm. in that period, but those lives were, because many of them worked as prostitutes, were in many ways much, much harsher, much more yeah. desperate than mm. the men who were working on the railroad. Mm. Um, and so I felt like it was incumbent upon me to sort of address their lives a little bit, began to oh. think about that space uh, in many ways. And um, I think my interest in anime comes a little bit out of that sense that uh, for all that some of the male figures in the Chinese American history have had a very difficult time, the oh. women have almost consistently had a difficult and challenging time in some ways. And I think in the context of the narrative, they represent the strongest figures in the book to my way of thinking, because they're the survivors. I think in many yeah, ways. Right. Um, and I think for me that, that felt very important in the context of writing about Chinese American history and, and to some degree about Chinese culture because certainly from the period at least where the book starts, um, the valuation uh, in Chinese culture of men and women, boys and girls, is so distinctly unequal in various mm. ways. It felt as though I wanted to think about that question and address it a little bit. And I was very conscious even from the get-go that 
you know, we move from a space where we think in the 1860s of a largely male bachelor society of Chinese arrivals, and we think in a more recent context of um, a lot of adopted baby girls arriving from China as well. Mm -hmm. So it felt interesting to think about those two gendered groups of immigrants at different ends of the historical spectrum. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to go back to the, the male component um, and sort of do this again. I'm thinking Ling and John, um, who interestingly struggle with attractiveness and yeah. you know, actually being able to sleep with these prostitutes who are Chinese because they won't sleep with Chinese men. Um, and you know, John being a sort of, you know, and, and he's searching for his identity as well and, and his attractiveness and how he appeals. Um, and then there's this overarching patri patriarchy that's happening. Um, Lisa, you sort of, you have that in every aspect of, you know, uh, how Polly relates to her father, um, to, to Leon, so all these different men. And there's this, don't do this because you're a woman. You're unappealing, it'll never work out for you, you know, all these different things. So can you guys talk about the male characters and, and specifically like the, their struggles? Um, <laughs> Let me think about it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as, as the designated male, as the male. Uh, Chinese male, uh, 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 I, I think um, I, you know the Anna Mae Wong character. I think uh, made me think quite a lot about this question. Uh, she's she's globally famous for being Chinese and mm. famous for playing exotic characters, the Madam Butterfly characters, the Dragon Lady characters, all the stereotypes we think of now, and she's one of the agents of creating those stereotypes in mm. some ways. She yeah. becomes successful and famous for portraying those. Um, and while she's famous in the West for those roles, she's also somewhat reviled in China for undertaking those roles, I think. Um, but I do think there's a kind of Western exoticization, uh, a, a classic instance of Orientalism, in which um, Asian women, Chinese women are, you know, sexualized in some of these ways. And anime seems like she was a very uh, specific early example of that, although there are precursors as well. And that the, the sexual visibility in those ways of Chinese women, those stereotypes, also create other stereotypes that rebound upon the males, mm. right? So the women are, uh, if they're dragon ladies, then the men by comparison, the Chinese men by comparison, can seem effeminate, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and so this, this goes partly to the way those images are constructed, but it also goes back even to a, the, the earliest periods of the gold rush in the transcontinental. Chinese men arrive, um, you know, they have, they're wearing cues which to Western eyes look like a kind of female, uh, mm -hmm. kind of, uh, wear, wearing the, the hair. Um, they are thought to be smaller and weaker. That's one mm -hmm. of the things that um, they work on the transcontinental sort of pushes back upon as a stereotype in various ways. So there are a number of factors that will play into that space. But it does feel like this sort of ironic and sort of tragic tandem that um, both male and female identities, at least sexually, are exaggerated in opposite directions. And it does mm -hmm. feel as though mm -hmm. there's a kind of binary at work in right. those regards. Right. And at least Leon sort of is so, sort of contradictory to that because he's in a loving relationship with Polly and he's sort mm -hmm. of a strong right. brood of a man. He's the right. complete opposite of that. Right. Until, you know. Yeah, he's definitely, I mean, he's Polly's boyfriend. He's a meat cutter. He's right. kind of this like beefy boy. muscular dude who right. is kind of like silent and like, you know, right. um, macho in a lot of ways. Yeah. You know, I mean, we're all products of our, of right. the world we live in, right? right. Um, right. And, and Daniel or Deming, um, he kind of goes by his, both names throughout the book, um, who's my protagonist, is also a male Chinese-American character who um, kind of, you know, he's got, he has sort of an interesting play, place character-wise as um, a male adoptee of, of two white parents. Mm -hmm. um, and in contrast, um, he, his foil is sort of this, this um, female adoptee, his friend Angel, who, right. who is a Chinese adoptee and sort of she's kind of fetishized in her own ways by her mm -hmm. adoptive parents, um, you know, and that's something that I think I saw in The Fortunes that I really enjoyed that was like kind of this role that we put on Chinese girls, like what does it mean in terms yeah. of kind of fetishizing girls over boys? Um, what does that say about the expectations that we put on Chinese American girls over Chinese American boys? Mm -hmm. and, and and again, it's one of those ironies that, you know, if, if we come from, at least historically, a cultural space in which boys are valued over girls, uh, one of the one of the odd narratives of the Chinese American experience is that in these contexts, sometimes girls are valued over boys, right? Oh. So the, the movement from China to the US in some ways inverts some of those gendered valuations, I think, oh. in some ways too. Yeah. So it's ironic and it, it doesn't serve either gender particularly well, but the flip seems interesting to me. It right. seems like a, a 
potential way, of, potential mode of conflict to address in the book. Mm. Yeah. So I think we would sort of be, if we, if we didn't go into the subject of identity, and you guys have sort of touched on it a little bit as you're explaining things, right? One of, one of the, something that struck me in a heavy way as reading this, and I thought you guys handled it so well, and it was beautiful, is this loss of identity and this gaining of a new identity to sort of lose identity again, or be lost within that weird middle place, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking Deming becomes Daniel, Palon becomes Polly, losing the Q, dressing more Western, you guys do these symbolic things that signify a loss of identity, a loss of self. And then this real self, you guys have this interesting, and you guys both do it in different ways, where the real self gets buried down and the characters almost revisit it as a way of touching themselves mm -hmm. and realizing that they're lost and, how, and can measure how lost they are from the real self. So can you guys talk about this identity theme and how it's playing in and the importance of, of that? And then we'll get to this middle space of being hyphenated American, whatever it is, mm. nationality American thing, because I think it leads to mm. that. Yeah, that was, that was something that I felt like I wanted to explore in my book and that I also really enjoyed in The Fortunes was kind of this Asian American double consciousness yeah, where, absolutely. you know, the characters in both our books, I think, are being seen um, by other people in certain ways that, that are at odds with how they see themselves, but yet how they're being seen affects yeah. how they see themselves, yeah, right? So there's this kind of constant back and forth, and I really also wanted to resist kind of having it be this like simplistic either or between Western and Eastern or like yeah. American and China, because I think that also kind of negates um, the Asian American or the Chinese American experience, which is really important and kind of at the center to my characters and them trying to like find a way to forge their own identities mm -hmm. um, outside of their families, outside of, you know, whatever other social pressures there are. Yeah. No, and, I, and it's, it's interesting too because I think for both of us, um, the attention to names, Western mm. names, Chinese mm. names, play an awful lot of part in that and speak to this sort of um, doubling of identity that mm. we've been talking about. But yeah, it, it does always feel to me, and even when we talk about um, Chinese Americanness, it feels as though that sort of hyphenated identity, I think this is true for a number of hyphenated mm. identities. Um, seems to imply a kind of choice. Which side of the hyphen do you lean? Mm. Where do your loyalties lie? And that feels always like a kind of no-win choice right. to me. If one cleaves too much to one's heritage, then there's a, what, a failure to assimilate into the mainstream mm. of the, the country that one is living in. If one assimilates too much, is that a betrayal of the heritage right. that one comes from? So I think that when we think of it as a choice, as a duality, it feels very much as though it's just lose-lose. Mm. And I think that's, that's at the heart of some of the anxieties of inauthenticity that mm. people in those cultures can experience. But I think the idea, and I, I, and I think Lisa's talking this very much too, that the hybrid identity is its own identity mm. in some sense. Yeah. It's one of the reasons why I, I chose The Fortunes as a title in the end, because The Fortune Cookie, while we know it to be not mm. Chinese, but you know, we don't go right. to Chinese restaurants in China and have fortune cookies, right. um, where of course the food is also not called Chinese food, it's just right. food. Right, it came from California. <laughs> yeah, right? um, but it somehow also feels like a, a very specific and somewhat humble Chinese-American signifier right. in some mm. ways as well. It's not of one culture or the other, but it's somewhere in that middle ground. I okay. want to suggest there was authenticity even in that hybrid identity. Right. Yeah. yeah, I agree that it's yeah. like, it is the hybrid identity to think of itself. Whereas like if we're saying, um, we're choosing between Chinese-American, it's almost saying that I'm not an American. You know, like American culture doesn't yeah. look like right. me. And I think that's completely incorrect. Right. Right. Well, and I think for me that it, it was, I mean, I grew up in Britain, um, and certainly when I was younger, I was very conscious of not looking British. Right. Right? I mean, Britain has become, separate to Brexit, a much more multicultural uh, community in the time that I've lived and actually now been away from it. Um, but my face did not look particularly English as I defined Britishness when I was growing up. Um, and so I always had this idea that if I went other places, if I went to China or if I went to mm. S Singapore or Malaysia where my mother's from, that I would potentially belong in those spaces. Mm. Um, but even that feels... I can remember living in Singapore for a little while and um, enjoying the anonymity of walking down the street and looking mm. like everybody else. Mm. Until least, you open your mouth. Until you open your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in fact, even once I remember getting in a cab in Singapore and, um, and I hadn't said very much, so I don't think the accent had given me away as yet to the cab driver, but he said to me, you're not from here. And I said, well, okay, so how can you tell? He said, you're too short. Mm. And that was really interesting, right? Because I, don't, I, you know, I was shocked by that because I'd internalized stereotypes that all Chinese people are short. And he was like, no, obviously not in, in Singapore. Many of them are much taller than me. So it, it just was a reminder, in a sense, not fitting in there uh, 
made me feel like I don't fit in in either of these places. So maybe we have to find some combination of mm. those identities uh, that is my own in some ways that I can play. Well, Lisa, can you, can you also speak to that? Because I feel like no one embodies that more than Deming, because mm -hmm. he, once his name is stripped away from him, he's still harkening back, and he wants this ideal world that he fits in. Mm -hmm. They can speak Cantonese to each other, right? right? right and he right. sort of has a secret language with other people that speak mm -hmm. Cantonese when they're in that restaurant. Um, and then he, you know, he becomes Americanized and then goes over to China and right. feels <laughs> alienated there too. So right, can absolutely. You speak to that? Yeah, I mean, that was something that I definitely wanted to examine with um, Deming's journey throughout the book, where it's kind of like, He's being brought to this new um, town by his adoptive parents right. who changed his name. They want him to assimilate in a certain way, and it's, all, it's not the right choice for him. You know, it's not really taking his own um, needs into account. Um, and yeah, as you said, he goes to China and he's like, well, I was born in New York. Like, I'm not, right. I'm not really part of here either. So it's kind of, his journey is really trying to find his own way um, that he, he eventually finds like with other Chinese Americans in New right. York City. Um, right. So it's kind of right. saying again, like, that's, that's a place where we can belong um, and, and not really have to like ascribe to either of those kind of simplistic, like right. white, white middle class America versus like, you know, China. Right. <laughs> like, there's, there, there's a very vast space in between those two. Right. Things, yeah. Yeah, I love that section of the book with Deming back in China, but I also find myself envying him because he speaks Chinese, his Chinese is right. rusty, yeah. right. but, but it can only get better get the longer he spends yeah. there, and so he begins to um, be able to navigate that space right. much better. And I, I don't speak any, um, Cantonese is my mother's mm. language, I don't speak any Cantonese. Um, and, but it, it speaks to the way that, not just the way we look, but the way we sound, mm -hmm. the, the language we have access to also mm. shapes identity for us as right. well. Right. Um, so I, I, I have felt a, but both kinship with his experience of uh, feeling not at home in the place that people mm -hmm. might have thought was home, um, but I also envied his ability to adapt to that home right. better than I could. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think he has much more of an agility yeah. of like code switching than yeah. I do too, because right. I, yeah. I can't speak fluently either. So. so there's this one thing I really wanted to talk about with you two, and something I noticed throughout. So the white characters. So I'm thinking Peter, Kay, Eileen, Jim, Mr. Mm -hmm. Crocker. They all have this, this this eye of invisibility, I should say, right? Where regardless of what happens and what and the amount of experiences they have with the certain immigrants, they never fully see them or enter that space where they begin to see them where they are, mm -hmm. right? Um, even to the point where, you know, Deming's in China and they're Skyping on his birthday mm -hmm. and his mom yells, his name is Deming, not Daniel, right? And it's just like, they still don't get it and it goes right. over the head. Why the choice to leave them in that sort of ignorant space or blind space? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I'm, I'm looking at Lisa in case she has a question. I mean, yeah, Kay, Kay and Peter are Daniel's adoptive parents. And, you know, I, I really, I mean, I saw them very much as a product of their um, socioeconomic class. They're right. upper middle class academics. They're sort of, you know, liberal, well-meaning white people. They're like a lot of people I've met in my life. Um, yeah. And <laughs> um, to them, you know, it's sort of like, their, their journey is really part of his journey as well, right? right? So, so him coming to his own, finding his own home, his own family kind of means that he has to reject both his adoptive family and his birth family mm. to find his own family. So story-wise, that's kind of why they, they end where they, you know, the story where they are and, and he, where he is. Well, it's interesting because they are, you know, when I think about some of the figures in in the fortunes, when you mentioned Charles Crocker, the railroad magnate who employs my character Ling, and while that's not a uh, obviously a parental relationship, it's kind of quasi-parental. Ling right. is uh, Eurasian. Uh, he sort of looks at Crocker as a father figure in certain ways. Right. Um, but it's, in a way, there's a kind of individuation question going on, right? There's that feeling mm. that the parents or the parental figure sees the character in a certain mm. way. Uh, it's a kind of white gaze, I suppose, in those regards. And for the character to be able to understand himself or see himself, he had to sort of step away from that space. Mm -hmm. So it almost feels as though the, in a sense, ultimately the white characters do, I think, fail to see mm -hmm. the Chinese characters mm -hmm. or the Chinese American right. characters. But maybe that's the point, because the Chinese American characters have to figure out who they are separate to the gaze from mm -hmm. outside. And, right. and again, we go back to that tension we talked about earlier between our identity is being built in some kind of negotiation between how we're seen and how we see ourselves mm -hmm. internally, right? And how do those line up and which do we lean into more or less at different times? Right. Absolutely. 
Um, so just to sort of open it up a little bit. So um, I read this, both these books, as a Liberian American, right? And found myself in a lot of these pages. Um, and I'm thinking about the section with Vincent where you know, Vincent gets murdered because they believe that he's Japanese. Um, and then all these other Asian groups start to get together and they realize they're Asian American. Mm -hmm. But they also feel this sort of weirdness because they're like, civil rights wasn't exactly for us, yeah. right? And so, you know, so I started thinking of this interplay between you know, these, two, these two novels are very much centered in a Chinese, Chinese immigrant experience, right? Mm -hmm. Chinese American experience. But there are a lot of things that are relatable to a broader everything, right, and mm -hmm. all types of marginalized groups. So how do you guys see this sort of affecting readers of all different spheres? And, mm -hmm. and it's a great question. I think with um, the Vincent Chin case is sort of the space where I think about that the most, I think, in the context yeah. of the book, because yeah. um, so Vincent gets killed in a, a barroom brawl by some white auto workers in Detroit in 82. Um, this is when, in a period of uh, deep economic anxiety where uh, Japanese imports are being blamed for the decline of the auto industry in Detroit. They mistake him for a Japanese, um, get into a fight at a club, uh, chase him outside, hunt him down for about half an hour, and then beat him to death with a baseball bat. It's a terrible, terrible case. Um, and for that, those two men um, receive fines of $3,000 and no prison time at all. Mm. Um, so it's enormous uh, injustice. Um, and speaking of strong female characters, Vincent's mother, Lily Chin, uh, is instrumental in sort of fighting for justice for her son. Um, and in doing so, sort of brings together a coalition of um, uh, Asian American activists and protesters. Um, and one of the great ironies, of course, is that Lily uh, is Chinese, has come from China to the US in the aftermath of the Second World War. Um, flees China in a sense because she can't stand to live there having seen the Japanese aggression during World War II and then her son is mistaken for a Japanese and killed uh, and then she finds herself making political common cause with the Japanese um, to try and get justice for him. So the, the circularities of those things are right. sort of bamboozling. Yeah. Um, but in the process of getting the case reopened, it has to be um, uh, pursued as a hate crime under federal legislation that has been brought into the civil rights um, mm. movement and hasn't previously been applied to Asians. So there is this question of whether there's a kind of usurpation of rights that blacks have worked very hard to, to achieve and, and, uh, and fight for themselves. Um, I think that it leans into a much larger conversation, which is, um, which is a problematic one, I think, of how we rank the struggles of various immigrant groups and various oh. ethnic and racial groups mm -hmm. within the US, right? So, you know, we, um, I think we want to resist, I certainly want to resist the kind of ethnic Olympics here of your, right. you, your case is much worse than my, my case and, and vice versa. I'm very conscious though at the same time that, um, you know, while Chinese working on the Transcontinental Rail Railroad worked under terrible conditions and worked for less pay than whites, they were paid, right? right. So there are significant right. differences in the, right. in the various Absolutely. circumstances of different, um, different groups have suffered in the history of the United States. But I also think there's a way in which, um, one of the reasons I'm so interested in stereotype, um, mm. it feels as though one of the issues, one of the burdens facing Chinese Americans and Asian Americans more broadly is this idea of the model minority and mm. positive Ooh. stereotypes, Absolutely. right? Yeah. Um, and in some ways, positive stereotypes, by their very nature, we might be less inclined to resist but in many ways, I actually feel that it's an even greater duty mm. that we have to resist positive stereotypes in order to resist negative stereotypes as well. Absolutely. And if we accept positive stereotypes, we're acceding to the logic of stereotype that affects not only our own group, but all other groups as mm. well. Mm. So it does feel important to push back even on positive stereotypes because they're all narrowing, I think. Mm. It's interesting. Yeah, and there's a way that the model minority has always, you know, has, has historically and continues to be used sort of as a wedge between Absolutely. white America and other Americans of color. So it's kind of set up in a way that it's like, well, look, Asians have succeeded. In a way, it serves to delegitimize our own anger and our own, own acts of racism against Asians. At, on the other hand, it also is used to perpetuate you know, racism against black and Latinos by saying, well, Asians have succeeded. Um, why haven't you? you know, and it kind of ignores all these larger historical and, and political um, facts you know, about, about why, why we've ended up in this, in this place. And I think Vincent Chin is a really interesting character too because he's still being used. This is like over 30, 35 years ago and he's kind of still being used as this catalyst for Asian American political anger. So I'm always, I don't know if you read this like 
article about Asian American fraternities that was I out did, um, by Jay yeah. Caspian Can, but it was I was super fascinated by it. And it just sort of like we're going on off another tangent, but it's no, tell but, us about you it. know he it, it's this great in depth study about um, Asian American frats. There in particular one hazing incident that re resulted in the death of um, a young man in New York City. But what I didn't know is that they the frats are sort of you having these kind of um, Asian American History 101 lessons Ooh, as part of their right. hazing rituals where they learn about Vincent Chin. And that's sort of like what kind of gets these young men to feel politically empowered um, right. in a place that they haven't before. And it's yeah. a very kind of like ethnocentrist right. view of political empowerment. It kind of lacks a lot of context, but there's Isn't still kind of like, like yeah. this need for like, you know, these young men like feel a need to connect to that case. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. so the question is like, why, why, like why, what are we lacking in terms of our own, um, I guess like access to a, a more like complex and, and like um, contextual Asian American identity that that case still feels so meaningful and fulfills a certain need for, for these young men. Um, Ironic, yes, it, yeah. one of the things, that, 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 that article is fascinating. It was in the New York Times magazine yeah, about two, yeah, yeah. three weeks ago. Couple I mean, the case, yeah. the hazing death has been, been prosecuted for a while now. Um, it's an extraordinary story. I mean, the young man in question, I think, was, was killed in a, a, a hazing ritual that was called the glass ceiling, which is mm. very poignant as a detail. Mm. Um, and I would also argue, I, I'm not sure about this, um, but I have some residual sense that some part of the violence of that hazing plays into some of the questions we talked about earlier mm -hmm. about um, the way we see uh, Asian males and their, their potency, their strength, their mm. masculinity. It almost feels that this is a, an overcompensation for them, mm. the violence of the hazing Yeah, rituals. it's a very it's like a macho, violent, yeah. like and East Asian cent male centric right. Um, right. view so of history. It, it, you know, they become uh, perpetrators of their own victimhood in certain ways in that mm. context. Which is so before I open it up for questions, I have maybe like one more. So I'm curious about the reception of these novels, especially now. Um, how has that been? And you guys are writing about a very relevant topic. Um, what's that been for you guys like? Mm. Are you now the representative of Yeah, the, I am. Know? I speak for right, all. Right, you speak for all. <laughs> like, across the world, apparently. <laughs> the largest, right. <laughs> the largest right. population. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. right here, it's right here. <laughs> Quite a burden. I bet. I know. Um, yeah, you know, it's been interesting because so much of the reception has been, this is super timely because um, yeah. now, you know, we have Trump as our president. We have this, you know, very violently anti-immigrant administration. Um, deportation and detention are in the news in a way that they might not have been before. Um, but what's interesting is that I did start the novel seven or eight years ago. Yeah. So it was based on stories that were happening back in 2008, 2009. And, and now they're sort of being stepped up, right, yeah. and, and in the news even more. So it's, it's been an interesting place to right. be and, and an interesting year to come out with the first novel and also about this topic right. um, yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's fascinating to me the way um, this actually happened when I was writing uh, my last novel, The Welsh Girl, which was about German prisoners of war held in allied hands. And I began that you know, before 9-11, um, but it was a historical novel in which the present and the treatment of prisoners of war, places like Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo, mm. kind of caught up with the past in a strange way. Mm. And that's certainly been true in the 40s. Particularly, I think that Vincent Shin section, where right. we think about the way economic anxiety and some uh, unbridled and unfortunate rhetoric associated with it mm. fuels a hate crime. Mm. Um, right. And I must admit, since I've been touring with the book, I've more and more been reading that section mm. uh, because mm. it feels as though it, it speaks to the time and. Uh, feels cathartic, I hope, for, both for me and, and, and for listeners who want to hear that section. One of the ironies, um, uh, one of the slightly bitter ironies, is that each of the sections of the book has a brief epigraph, and the epigraph from that section uh, was from uh, then, uh, not quite even, candidate Trump in about 2012, when he was first contemplating a, um, a run, and about a year ago, my editor and I talked about that. It was a, a line, I won't quote it here because it's fairly offensive, uh, not surprisingly, um, uh, in regard to the Chinese, and it used an epithet that is an important one in the context of the Vincent Chin killing. Um, and about a year ago, my editor and I, well, more than a year ago, 18 months ago now, were talking about it, and she said, uh, this seems really timely right now, but it might be very dated very soon. <laughs> and uh, of course, all oh. I can say at this point is, if only. <laughs> if only um, that was right. Yeah. 
Okay, so we have about 10 minutes left for questions. So if you have a question, come up to these two mics we have right here and uh, ask them. <laughs> Not all at once. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for doing this panel. I just finished the Leavers recently, and the Fortunes is on my Goodreads list. So in the context that you've just been talking about today's you know, political environment, what would you want Americans to understand about the experience of your characters and the experience of people who risk so much to immigrate to this country? Mm. I mean, I feel like as a writer, I'm writing a lot to pose questions, I guess. So ideally, I want my readers to either identify in some way with the characters or sort of question their own um, thinking or, or sort of, you know, um, kind of raise questions in their mind about what it means to be American, what it means to be an immigrant, um, what, it, what kind of questions about culture and identity mean. Um, and that's sort of where I'm at with with the book and being a writer. Mm -hmm. and it, is, it is hard to, to generalize, but, but I think one of the things that I'm struck by, not just in the context of writing the book, but in my own life and experience too, is that people who immigrate here really want to be here, right? They value this country and what it stands for, what it means. They are patriotic before they get here, right? Because of those aspirational values. Um, It would be nice to welcome them in that spirit, I think, is what I would suggest. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I think you, I think you just a answered my question. <laughs> Thanks. Oh. No? Uh, I want to follow up on what you just said about immigrants wanting to be here and the values that they, that they identify with in America and kind of go back to what you're talking about with hyphenated identity. And I was curious, like, what those American values you see are that immigrants identify with, and how to how it's possible to reconcile them with really holding on to yeah. both sides of the hyphen. Mm. I mean, for me, I feel like I just want to add more context regarding immigration, right? Like the idea that. I don't. I feel like so much of the way we talk about immigration is really in this kind of strange vacuum. Like we're not really looking at how, why people necessarily want to come. A lot of it is because the U.S. has been involved in other countries, right? It's like we are, we are, we are here because you were there, right? So um, we've been involved with wars. We've been involved with colonization, right? So there's sort of this reason for migration. Um, people come out of because of economic need, you know, for the most part, I would think, and and because. Their, place, their homelands have been made untenable for, for many reasons, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this doesn't really answer your question. <laughs> well, it, it's economic need. It's also, I think, economic aspiration. Yeah. Um, and so that sounds like people are coming for your money and your jobs. Right? Mm. Um, but I think they're also coming for a country that values and allows for economic aspiration. Right? So that's, that's the, the more positive way of right. seeing that, something that we... Uh, we all, I think, notionally share, I think. Um, it's funny when I, so we're on a panel, we're talking about what consensus be described as immigrant literature in some ways. Um, uh, for myself, and I realize that my own context is very different from that of, of many immigrants, um, one of the ways I immigrated before I arrived was by reading American literature, right? So I, literature, written by the, the, the American canon is one of the things that brought me here, right? So literature is an invitation, or was an invitation. I think it helped me adapt, it made me want to come, it made me um, excited by the possibilities. Um, mm. You know, and we talk about opportunity, and it sounds like economic opportunity, but even for me, coming, coming from Britain, it feels like cultural opportunity, mm. right? Um, it's the opportunity to reinvent oneself, I think. I could not have been a writer if I'd stayed in Britain. I'm pretty confident mm. about that. So those are, those are some of those aspirational things, I think, at least. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you all for talking about this and for writing about your experiences. Um, I wanted to ask a question regarding 
sort of the then and now of the immigration. Some people come here, immigration, looking for, as you say, you know, more prosperity, leaving an economic situation. Some people come here because they don't want to come here. They're refugees from wars and other issues. And there's um, a, your your book has a lot to do with the the railroad and before you know before the communist state basically. So there's a whole different psyche yeah. of the people who wanted to come here post cultural revolution. And I think that your book probably is more about that group. So what about that? What about the the before and after immigrants that came to the United States, why they're here, and how their identity is attached to that? I mean, there's no denying that there are different historical circumstances of arrival. And certainly when the first Chinese came for the gold rush and even to work on the transcontinental, they saw themselves uh, as a sojourner community. They would come, they would make their money, they would take it home. And that was one of the sources of resentment, I think. Um, uh, one of the things held against them by other new arrivals in the US who came to settle. Right? So that was one of the gaps between them, I think, in various ways. Um, and yet, I think one of the things I thought about a lot in the context of writing the fortunes and sort of looking at that sort of 100 and 150 year history of the Chinese in America was to think about how even later arrivals, even though they arrive for different reasons, in flight from war, for you know, in flight from the communist regime in many ways, um, their reception is shaped by those who've come before them, mm -hmm. right? The stereotypes that attach to men who arrive with cues attach to Chinese who come in the 50s and the 60s, right? So there's still a way, there's a kind of hangover. So even if the, uh, the reasons, the rationales um, may be different for the immigrant, their perception mm -hmm. by the space in which they enter uh, it's shaped by those who come before them. There's, a, there's almost a failure to understand those distinctions, I think, in some ways, that's why it's such a great question. Right. Yeah, and that's an interesting point, too, because it's like, who gets to be seen as a settler right. and as like um, an adventurer or a pioneer, mm. and who gets to be seen as the foreigner, the yeah. invader, right? I think that's something that is, has been timely across all of US history, right? And there's a way that, that in particular for, for many Asian, Asian Americans, like there's that stereotype of being perpetually foreign, um, even if you're like fourth generation. Uh, right. and, and that says a lot about, I think, um, how like we're seen um, in the US. And what about within the community? Like I'm, I'm Armenian and I'm actually writing a book about the Armenian immigrant mm -hmm. experience. Yeah. There's a pre-Soviet yeah. thing going uh, on and a post-Soviet thing right, going right, right, on. Right. So there's the people who were here first, the, right. the, Arme the real Armenians, you know, who were here first, right. and now the post is like, so for the same thing with yeah. every, every ethnic group, Definitely. really, you know, Definitely. so yeah. there's, a, there's, a, there's an established immigrant community, Absolutely. and then a new wave comes in. Right, and access to like language, fluency, citizenship, um, money, you know, that, all that stuff comes into play right. as well. So how is that in your book, when, because your is more modern, mm -hmm. like your story is more modern, how did you approach that part. Did you approach that part of it, or did you Simple. want to incorporate? Um, before, you well, answer, before you answer, so we only have time for the, to answer okay. this last question. Okay. Sorry, that's good. Right. 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 Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Should I answer? No, oh. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, my, my family, my my characters are undocumented, working class, very recent immigrants. So they kind of because of because of that and their own access to you know citizenship status and, and fluency and money, they are kind of located within a certain community within. Um, Chinese people in New York. All right, guys. Thank you so much for coming out. I hope you learned something. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys for giving us your Thank time. Thank you. That was fun. <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.